Uh, we're going to start uh, this session. It's a fire tag chat. Woody and Wayne have a few questions for James. Uh, we'll stop right in about a half an hour or so. Uh, we have, a, this is more reunion-ish, but uh, I will be sending you a link to the material we covered in 2014 that's all videotaped, okay? In addition to one that we already have together, which is a, a short 22-minute version, because the full version is about eight hours, and then we have, we'll have maybe 20 or 30 hours in that range of interviews with all of us about, you know, that uh, mostly started and uh, just for the historical record. So I'm gonna let y'all go ahead and start. Okay, where's the fire? It's right there. <laughs> um, so, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's very good to see such a great turnout for this fireside chat. Um, I have the honor of asking the first question. And the methodology that we used for this, uh, we solicited uh, responses from all over the country, and we picked the best ones. So here's the first question, and it actually has to do <laughs> It actually has to do with uh, the proposals that were written. So there's a rumor that's been going around. And we don't know whether to believe this rumor or not, so this is your opportunity to tell the truth and put this rumor to rest. <laughs> is there any truth to the rumor that you always started the NSBA proposals with the phrase, in the beginning, there were cities? <laughs> <laughs> is that true or false? Well, well there's nuance, right? <laughs> So it is true that we started one proposal with that term. And of course, <laughs> Shirley Hatcher jumped all over me, you know, as, as a sociologist to say, James, that's the most ridiculous comment I ever, I ever made. But I did start that. In the beginning, there were cities. Well, thank you for confirming that <laughs> rumor. But on the more serious side, uh, the question actually reads, uh, how did the idea for the National Survey of Black Americans start? Tell us a little bit about the background on this idea, the germinating moment, that moment when you decided you were really going to move forward on the National Survey of Black Americans. You know, this is kind of lost in antiquity um, in terms of where the idea came from. So one of the things we have to be really clear about um, is that not any one person is responsible uh, for, the, for the development of um, either the NSBA, um, which started before, by the way, the PRBA. And it was a product of discussions with people like Bob Kahn, uh, people like Jerry Gurin, Pat Gurin. Um, in fact, we got started early on, and, and I've, I've forgotten the guy's name that, uh, that wrote the early concept. Do you, I don't know if you remember that about the idea. So the idea actually came from, from, um, from graduate students. So when I arrived here in 1971, it's very important to know that there were lots of African American graduate students who were particularly in psychology who had already been selected. And they were very much concerned about doing research on the African American population in a lot of different ways. But as it turns out, they didn't have the vehicles in order to be able to do that, and were very frustrated by that. And it was in those discussions with people like Phil and others and so on that this idea kind of evolved out that we needed to do this major study um, on the African American population. And the more we got into it, the more we found out what n had not been done in a lot of different kinds of dimensions. And then. Its particular focus took place with regard to graduate students. So why mental health? Well, that's Woody. So w Woody was very, you know, why work? Uh, that was Phil, right? Uh, why social support? That was someone else. I mean, these were ideas that came not out of my fertile imagination necessarily, but by the fertile imagination particularly of graduate students who were surrounded us in, in terms of how we did it. So that's how things started. 
But we got great support from people like Bob Kahn, um, you know, Bob Zients, um, you know, even, um, even Angus Campbell was, uh, was actually helpful in terms of supporting us at the beginning. So just a quick follow up. So maybe just a quick follow-up. Uh, where what was the stimulus for focusing this study as a as a survey research study with a heavy emphasis on representative sampling? Can you just elaborate a little bit on that? Well, re remember I talked about this yesterday, um, and I think um, through our conversations, and I mean really now with the graduate students and Jerry and others talking about it. Um, and I've written, I've written lots of things about this. There's nothing magical about the survey research as a method. Um, it doesn't have any hegemony over any other particular kinds of method, experimental, qualitative, and so on. And I've made that point. The great thing about survey methodology is that you can collect large num amounts of data in a relatively efficient sort of way. And the idea always was that the NSBA had to be an omnibus survey. It had to represent lots of different kinds of perspectives and so on, not just my own particular interests, but the interests is of many people as we possibly could, because we always knew that in order to really exploit the data, we needed to have as many people invested in the data as possible, and that people had ideas about things. So there's a big section on issues having to do with work. Uh, we, we talked about the mental health. There's a big section having to do with social support. There were sections that had to do with the interests that reflected lots of people who helped put questions and other items. I tell people before that there were over 100 professionals who were involved with creating the NSBA um, questionnaire. Uh, we did this in work groups. And we did it over a period of, of over two years, and everybody got everything they wanted except for um, <laughs> except for the sex stuff. I talked about that yesterday. And, <laughs> and we even tried to get the sex stuff in there, but you know, it just didn't work empirically. Uh, people got thrown out of the house. But other kinds of things were reflected in the NSBA in that way. You gonna let him ask a question? So the, the next questions will be asked by my esteemed colleague. That's very good. So, you know, just following up on what you just said there, because in the beginning, you know, at the formation of uh, the NSBA, uh, the time and the environment for collaboration was very different within uh, the University of Michigan. And in fact, within the university, we hired individual researchers who were expected to do individual research. Uh, but you assembled a team of highly collaborative and really a multidisciplinary uh, team of researchers that added tremendous strength to uh, the research as you just described. Can you speak on how the university and funders look upon the, colla the collaboration then versus now and their willingness to fund this type of research? So we just finished a National Academy of Sciences Committee, which I was on, on something called Team Science. And actually, I've done a chapter that um, I just went over the proofs for um, about a week ago, which is going to have revelations about um, my time as an African-American faculty member at the University of Michigan. Uh, it's probably um, in politic um, what was said in that chapter, but I explain a lot of this. So the psychology department was not a particular hospitable place for team science. And that's putting it mildly. And, the, and it was, I was always committed to the fact we couldn't do the National Survey of Black Americans outside of a team science context. It took multiple perspectives. It took multiple uh, types of um, disciplines. It took people coming from lots of different kinds of directions. Because one of the things I've always argued is that unlike um, the research on a particular problem, when you do research on a population group that is discriminated against, you have to understand large numbers of different kinds of things. Context becomes important, structure becomes important, economic issues become important, 
and one person is not going to encompass all the knowledge and understanding to try to get at those particular perspectives. So you have to have a team science approach because you really want the team to be invested in trying to do this so you could talk across those things. So in doing that, of course, you know, one particular discipline, my disciplinary background is psychology, um, but I had to be able to talk to economists, to talk to sociologists, uh, to talk to people from social work, uh, to talk to people from anthropology, to be able to talk to all those kinds of people, which means you have to devise uh, the kinds of communication skills and so on to be able to do that. And they have to be able to talk to you. And therefore, you have to have a team science approach, in my estimation, to do high quality research on the African American population. And that's the way in which we viewed it. So um, what today, what would make uh, that particular effort more difficult to achieve given the changes in the university environment? And in particular, you know, this three letters come to mind, indirect. <laughs> three letters? Yeah. IDC. IDC. Yeah. I mean. So what they're talking about now is that, so, so things, universities have undergone uh, massive changes in relationship to indirect cost recovery. So we don't want to get down too much into the weeds here in terms of how we think about it. But the reason why we could do what we did at the University of Michigan, and I think it would have been very difficult to do this at almost any other institution, was because of the existence of the Institute for Social Research. The Institute for Social Research was actually founded on a kind of a team science approach. Uh, Jerry and I have talked a lot about that since he was really one of the founders with regard to what the perspective was, but that wasn't necessarily reflected in other parts of the university. So when the Institute for Social Research was founded in 1949 by bringing together the Research Center for Group Dynamics and the Survey Research Center to found this place, uh, they were told by the regents of the University of Michigan, you can found the Institute for Social Research, but we're not gonna give you any money. And what you can do is you can keep your indirect cost recovery. 100%. Yeah, but you gotta remember, in 1949, the direct cost value of the, of the ISR was $250,000. So they made that comment, ha, 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 you know, live off your indirect cost. Fast forward, 70 years later, it's a hundred million dollar operation, and you can no longer keep your indirect cost recovery. <laughs> well, you can understand that, you know, so, you know. So it did become an issue with that. And that's, that makes it somewhat more difficult. Because one of the things we were able to do at the university during the period of time we were working on this project is that we could double count people's contributions. And all that means is that people who are in various different departments and other colleges, public health, other places, and so on, since um, the university had a different kind of budget model, nobody really cared where proposals were submitted. So that allowed us to put proposals in from the Institute for Social Research to support efforts like the National Survey of American Life, the National Survey of Black Americans, and so on. And it's become much more difficult today in order to be able to do that because deans are jealous gods. Um, and they're much more concerned about people and people around the table, particularly some of the people who are in important administrative positions, know exactly what I'm talking about. So it becomes very difficult to put together the kind of team science that cuts across various different kinds of administrative units within the university to focus your effort in one particular place like the Institute for Social Research. Now, I think we can overcome those kinds of things. Um, as Jerry said, I, I was a willful child, and uh, now I'm a willful old man, but you know, I think we can overcome those kinds of things, but it's become much, much more difficult 
to put together the kind of the team that we've had historically. Um, and also, the second part of that is when we started this project, um, other areas of the university were necessarily hospitable to uh, either black faculty or graduate students or any other thing. Today, that's changed a lot. And we've actually created many other kinds of programs and projects, you know, whether in the School of Education or within social work or within uh, public health. Uh, and so think 1980, the program for research on black Americans was kind of the only game in town. And that's no longer true. So in some ways, some of the, quotes, competition, I don't think about it that way, you know, actually comes from other units, other programs, other projects for which people are putting their time, effort, and energy into. So it's, it's just changed all the dynamics. Now, we can overcome those, we can think about how we construct it, in what particular sort of way. Um, in fact, the program itself was about the business of seeding these kinds of programs, and we played a major kind of role in that. So I'm not complaining about that at all. I'm saying that's great. It's like I said I would be successful in the Department of Psychology when I didn't know every single graduate student or had to serve on every single committee within that department. So right now I don't know any graduate students in psychology anymore, actually. And that's a good thing. That's a great thing. That means that other people are taking the, the, the role. We have other people who are playing those kinds of things and so on. But that's a big change. It just made things more difficult. Make sense? So just to build a little bit on that concept of team science, uh, I remember very vividly as a graduate student uh, the first meeting of the NSBA advisory board. And it was the first time I met uh, AJ. Uh, it was the first time I ever got a chance to sit down with uh, someone like Sherman James and find out what epidemiology, and I should say social epidemiology, was really all about. Uh, from, from his vantage point. So I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on your thinking behind putting together this advisory panel, you know, and sort of recognizing the need for that kind of uh, advisor. I think Carl Bell was, uh, yeah, it was the first time, I, yeah. So can you talk a little bit about that? Well, so the idea was is that the, uh, the National Survey of Black Americans and then later the Program for Research on Black Americans was always thought to be a national project. In fact, in some ways, uh, an international project and is actually has grown to be that particular sort of way. So it wasn't something necessarily only at the University of Michigan, um, but instead it was to provide an infrastructure in terms of data and other kinds of opportunities so that we would be able to get development of an intellectual capacity in terms of research in this particular area. In order to do that, you really wanted to have buy-in from a broader swath of people as possible. So, and remember, the idea always was, like Carl Bell, uh, in the way in which he pushed us, the, the ultimate purpose of a survey like this one and the work that we do is actually, um, I put it this way, to give voice to the black American population to allow them to speak what they think and so on. So that was, um, it had to be a national project. So therefore we had to have advice from a national broad swath of people, including community people. Yeah, I mean, you know, Phil remembers uh, lots of community meetings, lots of outreach with regard to what people were doing. Uh, we had been part of this kind of uh, community psychology movement um, you know, so we were doing lots of things like that, and out of that grew this whole notion about the survey. So that was important. That was the reason. So the next question has to do with uh, something I think you touched on briefly yesterday, but we want to hear you elaborate a little bit. And, and that is why did you or the team select the National Institute of Mental, Mental Health as the funding source for what was obviously a, an omnibus study that was much broader than the concept of mental health. So why NIMH? So I would put it the other way. The National Institute of Mental Health uh, selected us. 
So this is because of Rita Duma and James Ralph when they created the Center for Minority Center for Mental Health and they became interested in the possibility of being able to do this. Other institutes at, at uh, NIH, NIH or at the National Science Foundation really had no interest in this particular kind of project, but they had an interest. And by working with them, we were able to develop the, um, the proposal and ultimately to get the proposal funded. But, but I, I think James uh, Ralph and Rita Dumar are the heroes or heroines in this uh, because they had the vision uh, and the willingness to give um, a relatively young group of people uh, quite a bit of money in those days. It actually wasn't that much money, I mean, think about it, you know. I think we got, um, I think the whole proposal cost $600,000. The study cost $1.2 million. So as you can see, the math is not really hard. It cost twice as much as what we got to do it. Where did the money come from? Well, that's another story. They haven't asked me that question, so we'll see. So just a quick follow-up. Where would the money come from? <laughs> so just a quick follow-up. My memory is a little hazy on this one, but uh, I want you to help me out a little bit. Uh, I think I remember um, at some point once our data were in and we started reporting the preliminary or the initial findings, uh, Jim Ralph uh, put out a, I think it was either a press release that, that, that essentially talked about the high level of mental health needs in the black community. And I believe that his press release coincided with uh, some, some other studies that NIMH were conducting at the time. And I sort of vaguely remember you and Jerry and Carlos, and, and I think I tagged along. Yeah, uh, having to go to NIMH and talk to them. Can you tell us that story? So we call this trip, the four of us took this trip to, to because we got called on the carpet. And the issue was that we were saying something for which there was really not good proof for. Of course, we didn't say it. James Ralph is the one who put the thing out. But we had to go to Washington and explain why we weren't crazy. I mean, literally, we had to go and explain. And, and poor Jerry, we, you know, we'd drag a Jerry into there, you know, put him in this kind of situation. So a lot of people don't know, but the National Survey of Black Americans started before the real development of the diagnostic instrument, DIS, the, uh, diagnostic interview, schedule. interview schedule that Lee Robbins and another people had done. So the epidemiological catchment area study, which was the first large national estimate using this uh, kind of naive interviewer um, methodology for ascertaining disorders, came after the National Survey of Black Americans had already started. And that technology was not available to us when we were planning on doing the study that we did. We started, and Woody explained this yesterday, by using the Langer um, symptom kind of process. Uh, we used kind of a serious personal problem kind of approach. We were greatly influenced by um, uh, Americans View Their Mental Health that Jerry had been one of the co-authors on. And that was a very important way in which we looked at it. Not so much worry about the diagnosis of mental disorders, but really worried about people who are having serious personal problems, what was the nature of those problems, how did they cope with those problems, in terms of how did they get over it, and so on. So that was the approach to the National Survey of Black Americans. It was not about categorical disorders that we were trying to find. But Jim Ralph got very excited about what we reported in terms of the nature of the serious personal problems in, among the African American population and got a little mixed up and reported this. And then a lot of the professionals at the National, um, uh, the National Institute of Mental Health got very upset with that and called us on the carpet. But I think we did a good job. I'm not sure they thought we weren't crazy by the time we left, but, <laughs> but we did the best we could, you know. So uh, James, let me just take you back uh, for, for a second. And that is um, you had a, um, a uh, storied uh, you know, career 
and uh, you've been to many different places and you've done lots of different things and you've been very successful. So this question is actually for, for benefit of the, the younger researcher. And that is, uh, decades ago, researchers had much more freedom in choosing the line of research uh, to pursue. You clearly had that, uh, as well as with the graduate students who participated in the early NSBA. And today, uh, with both the government, and thanks, Carl, for letting us know what will be funded and what those lines are, but the government and foundations are being much more prescriptive uh, about uh, the research issues and sometimes even the approaches to be taken. Uh, so how does the emerging scholar get funded but still introduce novel ideas into the research equation? Well, it's become difficult, let's, let's face it. So whenever we talk to young people today, you know, we start off with that particular uh, concept. Um, so, uh, when I first came here, I was impressed with Angus Campbell, uh, who was then the head of the institute, uh, liquor had just stepped down. And what I was really impressed about is that uh, Angus Campbell wrote a letter and got a million dollars to do the study on the well-being stuff. Boy, I said, that's really impressive. So, I just got to learn how to write a good letter. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll get that kind of money. Well, it turns out it wasn't that easy. But I will tell you that it was a lot easier than, than it is now. And it, there's absolutely no doubt about it. Uh, the whole process by which um, investigators uh, find support for their research in any particular way is a lot more difficult in uh, 2016 than it was uh, in 1970. It's just things have changed. Um, I was always uh, um, influenced by what I was told by one of my uh, senior mentors uh, when I was going to graduate school. So I asked him the question about how do I prepare for, quant uh, for um, those exams you take right before you see how soon you've been qualifying exams and that kind of stuff. He said, you know, you have to get the ability to answer one question really well. And then you have to take every question that you get asked and turn that question into the question that you can answer. <laughs> I was always influenced by that. So you have to be able to indeed take that work for what you're interested in and what you're passionate about. And you have to be able to turn that particular problem and question into something that someone's going to give you some funding about. Whether it's the federal government, whether it's your university, whether it's a private foundation, and so on. And that's the skill that I think that you have to be able to learn. Uh, and that's the way things are today. But it is just much more difficult. You have to put grants in now, and it takes a lot longer to get it. Um, but in some ways, it makes it even more important that I think vehicles like the, the NSBA or the NSAL or other kinds of vehicles uh, can be conducted by more senior people uh, that can then provide opportunities for younger people for pilot data or for actually publications for other kinds of things than ever before. I thought it was important back in the 70s and 80s but I think it's even more important today. It's just very difficult. I can tell you right now to redo the National Survey of American Life right now would cost in excess north of $40 million. Right now, to do it right. If you're gonna have good probability samples, large samples that are gonna be able to cover the kind of things that you're looking at, I can tell you right now that's what the cost is. Quick question about the National Survey of Black Americans. What do you remember as your most challenging uh, moment during the field period? So we were, so Jerry has said this before, that, that James is crazy, but I wasn't the only one that was crazy. So Belinda and I and Shirley and Phil would look at each other once we got started this and said, what the hell? <laughs> How do we get involved with this? Why are we doing it? If we'd have known better, we would never would have done it. 
So the most challenging thing, and, 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 and we were social psychologists, so we should have known this. So we were, do, we were conducting the training of the 400 interviewers who participated in the National Survey of Black Americans. We actually ran our own field office. And thank God for Shirley, because she really knew a lot about this kind of stuff. But when we got to training, and remember, we were dedicated to having interviewers who were from the neighborhoods. These were people who indeed were part, because that was very important to us. And we said we were going to do nine-day trainings because people had to be thoroughly trained. And we totally forgot that in that long a period, it would create all kinds of norms, uh, cliques and groups would develop. You know, and as it turns out, we got in the middle of this, and people from the neighborhoods were trying to hijack the training. <laughs> you know, it, it was just... And so every single training turned out to be um, uh, a, a, a test of our ability to be able to manage, you know, individuals and people in a way to get this thing done. And, and I never forget the one training we did in Detroit. It was really, it was really funny. So we're training community-based people. One guy was a, a minister, uh, whether Jack Lake minister or something, I mean, which he did this stuff and so on. So we're training on the, on the interviewer, and, uh, and uh, the, we asked a question about how often you go to church, and we're doing these practice things, and the person said, well, you know, I don't go to church. And the interviewer said, why don't you go to church? I mean, church, church. <laughs> <laughs> and, we, and, and, and we said, well, you know, you are supposed to be an objective listener here. You, it's not your task to, to question the person and so on. So it was those kinds of things, I think, within the particular training that was really very hard. You know, I tell people it's a fun thing. We had to, we had to develop. Uh, so the issue is um, a national survey of the black population today actually has the same problem as before. This is the second part of this. And the problem is, is that the black population is distributed in the United States in two ways. It is concentrated, particularly in inner city locations and so on, but it's also spread out. So the question is, how can you, for an effective price, actually get a random probability sample of that group? And I thought about this a lot. I prayed on it. We talked about this a long time when back in the National Survey of Black Americans. And I tell people, this is, but it's the honest to God truth. It came to me in a dream. And the answer was, ask white people if you want to find black people, because white people will know where black people are <laughs> in areas of low density. That, no, that was the answer. And I called Shirley, it must be about 3 o'clock in the morning. I didn't bother filling them. I called Shirley and say, I said, Shirley, I got it. And then Shirley and I actually then kind of worked through some of the details with Phil and, 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 and Belinda, of course, in terms of developing WASP, which was the wide area screening procedure. So the question is, how indeed can you, and, and you know, we set up a pretest in, in Detroit to test the model and so on. And what we discovered um, is that you, in an average 60 household unit, uh, if there were very few black people there, you could find all the black people in that area by asking no more than three white households. <laughs> and they would know exactly where black people were. <laughs> you know, and in it, inadvertently, so in, inadvertently, one of the things we discovered, we never published this, but what we discovered was that why why white um, neighborhoods tip at 10%. And that was accidental, we never published it. But what happened was, whenever blacks, the numbers of blacks rose to about 10%, the perceptions of whites within those neighborhoods was that it was at least twice to three times that a month. But not until that point. It was like a tipping point. If it was 6%, then they will clearly be able to say that it's a small number. But something about 10% of the neighborhood was black, 
then the numbers would be perceived as being a lot larger. So that was one of the things that we learned. But anyway, it turned out that procedure worked perfectly. Uh, we did about 20% of, of, the, of the households found were what we call WASP households. Uh, we did a 10% uh, follow-up in which we went to all the households just to make sure we were doing it. And we didn't miss any black households at all in the National Survey of Black Americans. And so then the National Survey of American Life used the same procedure. It was really funny. <laughs> but that was a real problem. Last question. Ooh, do, do you want the last one? I've got I'll, some really good ones. I, 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 can I ask a question? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll cede it to you. Are, are you sure this is the last question? This is the last question. Okay, this is a tough choice, but um, I think I'm going to go with this one. Um, I've heard you say many times that the 60s were heady days. What did you mean by that? Are, and are you as optimistic today as you were in the 60s about the promise and potential for social advancement and equality for black Americans? That's a very difficult question. Um, so uh, I am a member of a certain kind of cohort. Um, uh, I've named the generation of African Americans who came out of the 60s as um, the disappointment generation. And the reason why I've said that many times is that the 60s were heady days. So we could do anything, right? You know, we were wearing dashikis and I remember we took over the American Psychological Association one time. A lot, a lot of fun. I mean, the 60s were fun for a lot of reasons. But the greatest thing, of course, was that we were going to solve the problem of race and other kinds of problems and so on. And that didn't exactly happen, you know. Then, of course, we, when Obama was elected, we had post-racial America, which is no longer post-racial, by the way. It just it went backwards. So it was, it was kind of a difficult period, and it's been a difficult period of adjustment for people about my age, so 65 to 75, 80, that kind of group. And it shows up in the data, by the way, if you look at it carefully. It's, a, it's in the data um, about what I call this kind of disappointment. So it would be good if we had something that looked like that. Certainly things have changed. If I can make a comment, I'm, this is a comment. It's not even asking this question. As I look around the room, in terms of the number of researchers that we see, it's absolutely amazing. So I think the future is actually very bright with regard to the kind of social and behavioral science research in this area that's related to issues of race and race equality and other kinds of issues, it's much, much better than it was in the 60s. So in some ways, they, these are potentially heady days for what the next 20 years should look like in terms of the quality of the research and the, the papers I've heard this morning, today, yesterday, and so on, and the quality of the work that people are doing. It's, it's much better than, than we started before. Wouldn't you say that's right, Phil? 100%. And I think that's just absolutely amazing. So the future is bright in that particular way as we look at the beginning of the 21st century. So I'm very excited about that as well. I'm not so excited about this political election, but you know, you know, we'll see what might happen with that. Thanks. All right, well, I think this has been a great session. I want to thank Dr. Jackson for taking time out of his busy schedule to show up here today. This, uh, just one final comment. This is the first of many fireside chats we will be having with you. I, I, I don't have anything else to say. This is just part, you know, I thank everybody who's been involved. So as you know, with the major, you know, American Sociological Association, APA, people get awards. We know there's a little bias here and there, okay? <laughs> there, there, here, here and there. And so two years ago when we did this, we said, let's give a few awards, okay? We think it's important. Now in the same way, it's not quite like 
Little League Baseball or Soccer, where by showing up, everybody gets something, all right? But in some ways, I'm lying, because actually, just by showing up, you do get something. Everybody gets a pen. Oh, uh, you're not getting one. And everybody else, everybody except for Woody, everybody except for Woody gets a mug. Oh, uh, that's a serious mug. So Christina's gonna start passing out the pens, and as you leave, right outside, there's a whole row of mugs, one apiece. Okay? One apiece. So let me start, and, and let me just mention a, a few of the uh, of the rules. Okay, okay, shh, please. Um, let me just mention a, a few of the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, there's one thing we need to start first. Letha, could you come on up to talk about Shirley real quick? And also, uh, if you haven't signed your name uh, on the pad, uh, go talk to uh, Jamie to get your address down. Uh, you talk, talk to my. <laughs> no, okay, you don't have to if you don't want to. Hi, sure, this is fine. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, I have a little script here <clears throat> to keep me on track. You've heard a lot oh, about. Oh, hold up, I didn't know you had a script, girl. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. To stay on track. Wait for a second. This is like a comedy act. <laughs> okay, so here. Okay. I'm tethered to him. <laughs> so, good afternoon, everybody. You've heard a lot about Shirley Hatchett. Uh, her name has resonated here today. I thought I would give you just a little background information about Shirley. She spearheaded the field component of the National Survey of Black American. She was an expert in sampling and interviewing. She had worked on, I believe, two national studies, one with Angus Campbell, or maybe it was just one with Angus Campbell. Oh, that's right, the Detroit Area Study and the national study that Angus Campbell and Howard Schumann had done on racial attitudes. Shirley spearheaded the sampling and the data collection component of the NSBA. She was an expert in sampling. She was an expert in data collection, including interviewing and training. That's right, training interviewers. Uh, you have heard that the NSBA did its own data collection and sampling, which was something that was not normally done in those days. It was typically uh, done by the, the Survey Research Center's field office and field. I worked closely with Shirley. In fact, I was pretty much her apprentice in that she taught me a lot about sampling. I had been fortunate in that I had also worked on a national survey, which was a study that was done by a woman named uh, Monica Blumenthal that was the National Survey of American Men's Attitudes Towards Violence. <clears throat> Dr. Shirley Jean Hatchett received her PhD in sociology from the University of Michigan. Prior to her illness, she was an associate professor of sociology at the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. It was during her time that she was an associate professor there that she became ill, returned to Michigan to live with her family, and until more recently was cared for by her mother who was in her 80s. Her mother passed away two years ago. Since that time, her eldest sister, Jackie Hatchett, has assumed 
full responsibility for the care of her sister, Shirley Jean Hatchett. I have been in contact with Shirley's niece. I've also had some contact with her sister. We are asking you today to give a contribution to Shirley Hatchett. I realize that many of you don't know who she is, have never met her. I tell you that the gift that you give to her today will be used uh, and to defray the cost of any resources that Shirley's sister needs to pay for her care. And they are resources that are not covered by insurance, such as gowns and any other kinds of supplies that her sister uses in her care, in Shirley's care. Thank you for both your contributions and your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Peter make it so too. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> he just reminded me of the most important piece. You should make your check out to Shirley Hatchett. Her sister will be able to cash it and use it for whatever purposes that she will need. And that's H-A-T-C-H-E-T-T, -T, the hatchet, two T's. Right. Okay. If you have any questions, you can see me. I will be in the back of the room. I am Yeah, not. yeah, we'll, we'll take cash. We'll work it out. Thank you. Yeah, you, okay. give, you give me cash, I'll write the check. Okay. Yeah, the Bank of Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're good. We're good. Okay, give me a second here. Okay. We're doing good. We're doing good, Woody? Yeah, we're doing great. Hey, Woody, what you listening to these days? You know, right now, I'm going back to my Detroit techno. There it is. <laughs> and I just, you know, I, I want to clear, can I clear up a... a oh, I'm sorry, I just needed a second there. That's all I needed. I just needed just a second. <laughs> Oh man, I'm sorry, I gotta move on. So here, our first award, because I, 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 people will be leaving for the airport soon, so. Our, fir our first award was for Carl Bell, as y'all know. The second one was for a woman who was uh, born to be here, but she has a very famous daughter. So I think most of y'all, many of y'all know who I'm talking about. Uh, is, has anybody heard of Marley Diaz? Yes. 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 And Marley is Janice uh, Johnson Diaz's daughter. Mar Marley's been on, on TV everywhere you see. Uh, can somebody just explain? Uh, can I, somebody come up just to tell us a little bit about Marley? Uh, matter of fact, why don't you come up, Susan? Well, hold, hold up, sister. Hold up, hold up. Yeah, just just speaking to the mic. This is for the uh, the for the video. Okay. So Janice Johnson yeah, is actually a postdoc here in the poverty center, and she was a postdoc here as well. Um, while she was here, she had a little baby, uh, Marley. Yeah. And Marley is uh, the epitome of the apple not fall apart. <laughs> um, her mother is an activist and a scholar. And Marley decided, Marley's a left. And she decided, she came home from school one day and she told her mother she was tired of reading about books about white boys and dogs. And her mother said, What are you going to do about it? So she started to draw to collect a thousand books on black, featuring black girls and female characters. And she was successful in raising more than 
proud of it. So many books. So she took a whole load to Jamaica and had a book fair there. It was one time. So she's had a book fair in New Jersey. Uh, she continues to collect books and she's been on the Ellen Show, Black Girls Rock, Black Girls Rock. Ellen gave, she got her check for $10,000 on the Ellen Show and she did a laptop, a laptop computer. So she is an epitome of the next generation. Yeah. Now you stay here. Okay. So let me just mention this award is not to Marley. This award, and I'm, I'm glad you talked about Marley. I'm not trying to get on you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> this award, well, I thought it was important to talk about Marley, but this yeah. award is to Janice because Janice also runs a grassroots community activist organization that's extremely active, uh, does lots of stuff in the community. So this, you know, we want to talk, we want to recognize Marley, but this award is not just for being a mom. This okay. award is for being Janice. <laughs> However, there's a good reason we have you up here too, sister. Oh, why am I up here? <laughs> you know why you up here, but bam, here we go. Uh, uh -huh. Didn't see that coming, did you? Yep, and this is for um, community involvement. Okay. Um, Linda, do you want to speak for a second about? I got it. A second. Yes. She's my <laughs> secret partner in crime. And that was going to be my line. Yes. So <laughs> Susan has been my partner in crime because I became familiar with her, her artistry in the in the world of COVID and fabric work, and using that artistry to support your nonprofit. And tell them the number of nonprofit on the long one. It's the Institute for Education of Women in Africa and the Diaspora. And actually, many of you have already participated. You've come to a fundraiser, uh, you've bought an apron for action, which is what I sell, so and so, uh, and you've heard you give donations. So we, we started, I, I, I regard Susan as my uh, crafting buddy because although I don't quilt, and she doesn't crochet, we admire each other's craft. And she got me involved in crocheting scarves, all of that nervous energy that I have that I, when I'm watching TV. And I donate my scarves to Susan and put them on your Etsy site. Yeah, I have an Etsy store that we sell all of our products. Um, and we support right now, we're supporting 28 high school girls in Ivory Coast. Uh, the high school they go to has 11,000 students. Uh, it's in one of the core sections of the city. That's a college. It's more than a college. Mm -hmm. I was a little Yeah, lots of Yes. <laughs> so, very after oh. work for community mm -hmm. involvement. <laughs> Globally. Globally, yeah. absolutely. So um, our next award is uh, to one of the uh, speakers who was here, who uh, obviously you'll know who I'm talking about. And we'll, we'll have uh, James come up to uh, talk about some of the stuff that he's been doing. And this is a guy who works at the uh, Census Bureau. I wonder who that is. <laughs> so uh, Nick Jones, why don't you come on up, man? Here's a, this is an award for excellence in governmental service. Okay. Hey, James, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the, the stuff you know about and what Nick has been doing? About the work? Could you tell us a little bit about the stuff that, that you know of that Nick has been doing with the census? Uh, Bureau? Uh, I, I think I mentioned this before. We th This is supposed to work without the, the can you hear me? Yeah, yeah but. To speak up. Uh, and then when you speak up. Well, no, no, no. Like, We're talking about for the tape. Oh, for the tape. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I can know. Yeah. You know, so I've worked with Nick for a very long time. My memory is not what it used to be because I can't remember exactly what it was. Um, but remember, Nick was a graduate student, uh, Nicholas, excuse me. Uh, to being called Nicholas Clinton, um, in, in, in sociology here. Um, and he wandered over and we worked together. 
And I have been involved with the Guard, with the Census Bureau since the 1970 census, I think, that I've been on, the once that census was ended, when they changed over to the, um, the ways in which uh, self-reported race was used, I've been kind of on the census committee. So every year until, I don't know, after the 2000 census, and they, when they threw all the Democrats off uh, or something, it was kind of bizarre. But anyway, but, but, but Nichols went there um, to work uh, within, the, within the race division. And uh, over time, I think it's really brought a level of professionalism and research. Uh, and hopefully things that he had learned while here at the University of Michigan uh, as a researcher. And he's brought that same kind of professionalism and scientific curiosity and hard work, uh, I think, to the, to the Census Bureau. Uh, he talked to you yesterday about all the kinds of studies and the kinds of things that are going on. Trust me on this one. You know, he is at the, the heart of that. And he's excellent with regard to not only thinking about research in this kind of way that has this kind of large impact, but he is really very good at bringing together teams of people, you know. And he's done a great job of that. He has a certain kind of style where, where he can work with people across a wide spectrum in kind of ways. And he has a capability, which I think is really wonderful, of motivating people uh, to give they're just very intense. So, you know, we owe him a great deal of thanks. Uh, today, I think uh, we're looking at a much more rational approach to how we think about the assessment of race and ethnicity within uh, the most important study that we do, the United States Census. And a lot of that is really due um, to Nicholas Jones. So we owe him a round of thanks. That does me, yeah. So, um, the, the, uh, I'm inviting uh, uh, this uh, presenter to come up, uh, this person nominated, the individual is about to receive this award. So Anna, could you come up as a person who made the nomination? It doesn't matter. It, it, it'll come from the heart. So I'm going to tell you who the award is for. And the award is for, this is an early career excellence in research. Uh, this award is for Dr. Julia Hastings. Uh, Julia is uh, currently assistant professor at SUNY Albany. Uh, she just, her research focused on diabetes and depression, and she has a K-22, which is a dream, um, K from NIMHD, and uh, she just recently published a book on depression, and so I think she's doing a great job. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, uh, Anna, stay here. Stay, stay here, sweetheart. Okay. There you go. So, Anna, stand right over here. Anna, stand, just, just, just stand there. Okay, not there. Yeah, right there. Right there. Yeah, you're good. So, um, and you, why don't you hold this for me? Okay. So, one thing, you know, as I mentioned before, people are ineligible uh, if you're from University of Michigan, except for, except for one award. And um, in the same way, we can, there's conflict of interest that the things we just can't do. So Carl, is, since he's at NIA, one of our major grants is NIA, there's no way we can have Carl for our governmental service. As much as we would love to do that and ingratiate ourselves with him, we can't do that. <laughs> hey, I, I'm keeping it real, as I said. But, but in the same way, there's some people we can honor, like Dr. Anna Riley. <laughs> Anna has also received one of the highest honors, if I, maybe it is the highest honor, the highest. the highest honor that you can receive at the Center for Scientific Review. At oh, oh, excuse me. <laughs> excuse me. 
at the NIH. The NIH director's award. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So again, do you want to say anything? It's just an award for achievement, for a high honor, um, and helping the NIH to achieve its goal. And I received it because we do outreach for review. And for some reason, with my southern accent, they chose me to do the video for outreach for the early career reviewers. And it went everywhere viral. Wow. So as a result of that, I received the NIH Director's Award. We here at PRBA know how hard Anna works and what a good soul Anna is. So this was very easy. So good, congratulations. Here goes we are. Okay, we have a few more here. Just trying to. So we have another governmental service, and actually, I think y'all y'all understand this. This is to Rashid. I don't think I have to explain why, okay? <laughs> if there's anything, because Rashid has felt it out himself, again, congratulations, man. I appreciate it. I'm sorry here, I'm not, that's Janice's, I need to get that one out the way. Okay, so we have a few more here. Um, so this next one is a uh, early career excellence in research. And we have a person who's published at least 10 art articles off the NSAL, even though she's only been out for a year and one day. Wow. Uh -huh, yeah, you know. <laughs> Anne, Anne Gwynn, come on up, Anne. She was on her cell phone. I know she didn't expect this. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you, Robert. So, Anne came, it's a hot summer day. Anne came to my office, wanted to talk about religion. And I sort of I said, oh yeah, she's gonna be a great student. We'll probably work together. And I think Anne sort of felt that too, I don't know. And we've been working closely, me, Anne, and Linda, uh, and now Karen Lincoln for about three or four years now. Yeah, yeah. Does that mean you completely changed the trajectory of my career? Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So then we talked, then Ann switched over from straight psychology to the joint program. Uh, Ann is also a clinician uh, on top of being a strong researcher. It's very rare that you have both a person who do large scale survey analysis and be a, a one to one clinician. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, congratulations, Ann. Thank you. So now we're moving. Um, uh, I just want to make sure there's like another word, but the, the person hasn't arrived yet. Um, so now we have some of our highest level awards. And I'm saying the higher level because these are lifetime achievement awards. Okay? And uh, obviously, you know, we, you know, career longevity is a, is a blessing. And the very first one goes to, uh, and this is the same, same plaque that we gave to, uh, to uh, Jerry Gurin uh, two years ago. And this one goes to a person who's about to retire, uh, Dr. Belinda Tucker. <laughs> so this is what it looks like.
between Michigan and what was it? Maybe Stanford would have been at that moment in time, but that week when I was thinking about where to go for graduate school, I got calls from so many people, students, faculty members saying, you know, come to Michigan. We got a family here, a community here. I didn't get that kind of <laughs> treatment anywhere else. And I knew that would be feeling. This is pre-PRBA. And James started the same year that I started as a graduate student. And who knew that all of this would become, you know, what it did become. But uh, Pat reached out, Jerry reached out. In fact, my first supervisor was Pat Gurt. <laughs> And, you know, I remember just getting such amazing feedback from her about, you know, the, the article summaries I was doing. It, so it was always supportive. And when I left here, reluctantly leaving PRBA, but just thinking I had to do something else, other people told me about their graduate experiences, and they were nothing like mine. And they were shaking their heads that you could have had a graduate school experience that was so supportive. They could not believe that anywhere on earth, you know, this kind of, of atmosphere um, um, existed. And, you know, creating a whole new way of doing research. Now, James did not talk about being punched out by interviewers. Wow. Easily all over towns, you know, all over Birmingham. I mean, no one could teach you to do research like we learned to do it here. And all of you and all the people who couldn't make it are a testament uh, to the meaningfulness of this, you know, experiment by, you know, children. Yeah. <laughs> on some yeah. So thank you. I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. So, we have a few more. So, before we get to lifetime achievement, we have what I would like to call, but we're not calling it that. <laughs> I sort of like to call this the Spirit Award, okay? Person brings lots of energy, lots of spirit, has always been there for us. Um, came into town last week. We're having a summer program. Just gets into town. Walks over to the summer program. Just to hang out for an hour or two. To meet the doctoral students. To give advice to doctoral students. Um, always sends me emails. A new NSAL article. Um, sometimes as Phil and I both say, we had to rein them in a little bit. <laughs> but you don't want to rein them in too much, OK? So uh, uh, I think Mosi knows who this award goes to. <laughs> uh, Mosi, come on up, man. We have an award for you. Say that, because we know he's an excellent researcher. And we also know that part of this is both excellence in research, and part of this is, as I said, we come up with a lot of categories, and part of this is, a, for lack of a better term, a spirit award also. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks. Uh -huh. Oh, uh, okay. Well, I just got back uh, from teaching a class that uh, Philip Bowman uh, created some years ago. Um, uh, it's, uh, of course, I've retitled it. Uh, it's uh, now Race, Ethnicity, and Quantitative Methodologies. And um, it's, it's very fitting that I should return from that class to come back here again because, uh, and it's very fitting that this, that this award is both for research and passion uh, because of uh, things that Phil taught me when I was uh, uh, in undergrad. And it's things that I tell my students today, right, which is find a question that you are possessed by, that you are deeply perplexed by, and that kind of is informed by who you are and how you roll. And pursue that question with a dogged passion. And the reason why you want to do that, there's all kinds of, you know, Phil could tell you, you know, the whole multi-level chain of being. But 
the, the, one of the reasons why you want to do that is this work is, it can be exceedingly isolating. And it's also exceedingly difficult. And when you're there at 2 o'clock in the morning at your office with a leftover cupcake, <laughs> you know, and a half gone cup of coffee, and it's quiet, the only source of motivation is you and your research. Nobody's there and stoking you, encouraging you, no conversation, no other elements. And so when you pick work that you're passionate about, you do it better. Uh, the process of doing it, right, instead of it, uh, you know, when you pick, you know, something that a fancy advisor is doing and you want to try to get on a ticket and you don't really like it, you know, <laughs> when you're there alone and you're doing that work, that, the process of doing that work is going to break you down. It's going to tear you down to your core, right? On the other hand, if you're doing work that you're passionate about, that process that you're still engaged in is feeding you. It's, it's edifying you. It's making you stronger, better, faster. <laughs> so uh, so I, uh, I would say I humbly accept this award. <laughs> but we all know that would be a lie. <laughs> well, you put in an addendum? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what does it say? What's the addendum? Spirit. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, but seriously, I know these things are short, uh, uh, but I do want to sort of say one thing that I think is important that I've sort of tried to say. This is now my third time saying it, and I just want to get a little bit more practical about it. So, you know, we are PRBA, right? And many of us in here today wouldn't exist. Our research wouldn't exist. Our jobs wouldn't exist if it weren't for the PRBA. And, um, and many of us count on that cachet in order to be able to navigate spaces, right? Uh, I, I, I touched the PRBA, oh, you wanted a special Negro. Whether for good or bad, for better or worse, right? You wanted the cat that was well-trained and knows what you're doing and is connected to people who know what they're doing and have resources. Well, see, what happens is if we just go on about our lives and just say thank you very much, then the source dies. And we can't replicate the process, nor can we maintain our own positions. So one, there's all kinds of ways in which the PRBA might look in the 21st century. Um, some of them might have names on them and stuff, but other ones are just a way of doing business. And part of what I want to argue, especially to the junior folks in the room, is that when we collect data, we can write in contracts for special advising from the PRBA on how to collect this data. Now, some of these grants are going to be small. It's going to be a $2,000, $3,000 contract. Some will be big, $20,000, $40,000, $50,000 contract. Once it comes back to the PRBA, it can be either used to keep the PRBA running and collecting whatever it's doing and training graduate students, et cetera, or it can be put aside into a pool. So Ellis writes a grant, puts $100,000 on the PRBA kitty. Uh, Todd wants to do a pilot study. He applies for grant, pilot study grant funding from the PRBA. He gets that grant, he puts his money back, some money back in the kitty. This is not, you know, some kind of we need a policy. It's just a way of doing business. And we can build from that onto other, you know, annual conferences like this where we share the makings of our research, our data that we've collected. And so I think it's not like it's not a crazy, super hard thing. It's just you gotta do it. Absolutely. Anyway, sorry. Have a great day. Thank you. <laughs> And, and, and let me mention, I, I'm going to be real here. This wouldn't exist without Mosi's pushing. Yeah. Okay? Mosi is the one that said, we got to do this. And I'm like, oh, hell no, because I'm going to end up doing the work. <laughs> okay? But his passion, it's just passion. Their passion together uh, pushed me and Wayne, pushed me, Wayne and Woody. And then before we knew it, we were doing it. But I also was not upset at doing the work because I'm a full professor, okay? And that's just part of the role of a full professor. I mean, that's just reality. So we have a few more things here. So uh, Dr. Chidiha, could you come up, please? This is a Lifetime Achievement Award.
Oh, now you want to be involved. No, I'm just messing with you. Hold up, hold up. So That's I, all of our ideas. She yes. asked whose idea this was. This yeah. is everybody's. Come here. So I wanted to read this because as a graduate student, as a woman graduate student in PRBA, um, Letha, Shirley Hatchett, and Belinda Tucker were my role models. So this is presented to Letha Chadiha in recognition of your valuable and longstanding contributions to the Program for Research on Black Americans. Your survey expertise and scholarship were instrumental in the formation, development, and execution of the National Survey of Black Americans. Your continuing research contributions reflect your many years of dedication and diligence to the Program for Research on Black Americans. We recognize your excellence as a scholar, champion, and advocate for African American elderly. You have distinguished yourself as an outstanding mentor for students and junior faculty, and have been an extraordinary friend and colleague. Our best wishes and gratitude for your years of service in improving the lives of African Americans. Program for Research on Black Americans, June 24th, 2016. I must confess, I'm not certain this is working. No, it is. It's going just for the table. Okay. You remember the movie, Waiting to Exhale? <laughs> I have to exhale. Uh, thank you very much. I, I am speechless. Over the past five or six years of my life, as an academician, researcher, and teacher, I have received numerous awards. I most recently received a memoir in recognition of my service, teaching, mentoring, and research from the president at, here at the University of Michigan. I was impressed because I never knew that this university really appreciated what I did over the course of my career. I love mentoring students. It's been the hallmark of my career as an academician, and it is something that I will take with me through the rest of my life. I am, as I said, I'm speechless. I just want to thank you very much. This means more to me than those other awards that I have received, including being named the Distinguished Professor of Social Work in the School of Social Work, and along with James Jackson as an outstanding mentor of, uh, from the, the Task Force on Minority uh, aging from the Gerontological Society of America. So I will place this one at the top of the list. It's at the top of the class. And thank you. Thank you very much. So Woody, can you come here for a minute? I'm sorry. You can put that on. Okay. Uh, Belinda, this is yours. This is top. Uh, another Lifetime Achievement Award. I'm going to let uh, uh, Woody read this. Can, can I, I just have to read it? You can do how, uh, what, but just keep it short. But yeah, however you want to do it. So, um, four score and 20 years ago. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to keep it brief. There's, there are many, many things I could say about this next individual. 
I can't think of anything but positive remarks if I had the time to go into what I truly think about this person and <clears throat> how much I've learned from this person. Uh, he's a, he's a good, good running partner, uh, just an all around great guy. Um, I think, you know, I'll just leave it by saying um, I'm just really happy and proud to have somehow crossed paths with Dr. Wayne McCullough. Lifetime Achievement Award. So I'm going to read this. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Actually, there's something. Okay, I know what it is. All right. So, in heartfelt appreciation for your valuable and long-standing contributions to the Program for Research on Black Americans, your early contributions include your tireless efforts with the National Survey of Black Americans in providing important scholarship to the project, as well as leadership in survey administration, training, and data collection. I mean, Wayne and I did every NSBA training together back in the day. Mm -hmm. I mean, you heard the story from James. Uh, we were out there doing it. Your continuing contributions enhance the operation and progression of the PRBA and highlight your many years of dedication and diligence to this endeavor. You have distinguished yourself as an exceptional friend and colleague and role model for students, staff, and junior faculty. Our longstanding gratitude for your years of service in shaping the direction of social science research focused on the lives of African Americans. PRBA, June 24, 2016. Thank you. Congratulations. You gotta sit yeah. Wayne and I also go to St. Barbara, so I know it all. <laughs> um, I, I do want to say I, I appreciate this, um, and it was unexpected. Uh, one of the things I will note is that there were many people who, in the early days, contributed much to the organization, and you know I I do want to say I learned a lot from lots of different people. And in the early days, um, Letha Chadiha is one of those in particular who uh, we had a lot of graduate students running around, uh, people who were asserting they knew what they were doing. But it was Letha who would always check back with because she would say, well, <laughs> and then she would give you the straight shot. But um, learning from people like Letha uh, was extremely important. And I will tell you that uh, I went on to <clears throat> uh, spend $400 million in research uh, of corporations' monies. But uh, I learned how to do that most efficiently while doing the National Survey of Black Americans. So I thank you. Will you come on back up? And so while Woody's doing that, I'm going to just mention, Linda wrote all of these up for us. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so I guess I better just read it. Um, yeah, well, you know, if I get rolling on, on this one, I might never stop. But 
Um, you know, those of you who were at, at my house last night got just a very small morsel of the high esteem that I hold this next individual as, I mean, just an incredible role model, um, somebody who was rushing around all the time but was never too busy to stop whatever he was doing and spend hours just enlightening all of us uh, about the whole operation of social science research. But even more than that, uh, I find this particular person to be an incredible historian. Um, I mean, it's just unbelievable. How can one person know so much about so many things <laughs> going all the way back to the beginning? And so I know you all know who I'm talking about. <laughs> Philip J. Bowman, come on down. This is for you. <laughs> Truly deserving of a Lifetime Achievement Award from PRVA. Philip J. Bowman, your important contributions to the PRBA have spanned numerous years and immensely enriched its research and training missions. You are duly recognized as one of the architects, and I love that word, architect, because you helped build it, one of the architects of the National Survey of Black Americans and founders of the PRBA. Your leadership and scholarship was instrumental in fostering a program of social science research focused on the unique experiences of African Americans and dedicated to understanding black life in context. Your continuing contributions include your excellent work as a tireless mentor to students, postdoctoral scholars, and junior faculty across a number of diverse disciplines and fields of study. You have our heartfelt gratitude for your years of continuing service to PRBA and your efforts in improving the lives of African Americans. PRBA, June 24, 2016. Ho, ho, ho. You gotta say something now. <laughs> Jesus is not talking. That's oh, okay. That's all good. So, actually, as doing this, I thought about two things. So, one of the things I thought about that Linda and I, well, I talked to Linda about, she thought I was stupid as usual, is that I'm just, on, you know, I can't give one to myself, right? But I was thinking about, yeah, I was gonna give one to myself. So I, I, I may do that. I was thinking about using the theme of share. You know, nobody knows him like his woman. You know the yeah, so, something like that. Yeah, but on, on a serious note, I think that we're gonna also uh, do one for Shirley, and we'll send it to uh, uh, to her sister. Okay, okay. Um, uh, Wayne was instrumental because he's the one who set these up two years ago, and it made it really easy to do it this time. Because I was, I've been so overwhelmed with summer programs. It's like two weeks ago, I went, oh my goodness, will they have enough time? And they finished them, what, yesterday, right? So yeah, so we've been working really hard. Um, we want to thank everybody for coming. I'll be honest, I was pleasantly surprised that we had such a big turnout. Um, 
because uh, we figured, well, people did it two years ago, everybody has to pay their own way. Um, the odds would be low, and so really, really impressed. Uh, one or two quick things. Remember, uh, if you have a check for Shirley Hatchet, you can give it to Letha and she'll just put it in the envelope, or you can do that, but I think it's so much easier to write the check and give it to Shirley, you know, let her send it. And then the second thing is the Emerging Scholars Fund. So you all have that envelope. You have this information right here. And again, if you, if you want to write out a check now, you can give it to uh, Jamie, and Jamie will, 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 will put it in the fund. We'll give it to Patrick, okay? But, but the important thing on this card is actually your comment uh, or commentary about the PRBA experience. That is what we really do want to capture as part of the historical record, and it's what we will also use to bring others into the poll to help build the fund. I have a question about Robert, do we have cash for so confused? Yeah, give it to me. So give it to me, and then I'll write a check. And, and I won't cheat anybody. <laughs> I won't pocket it. It'd be like the check cashing places in Chicago, right? <laughs> yeah, we're not gonna do that. <laughs> yeah. uh, James? Let me just say one more before we go. We talked a lot about, um, and I talked about the fact that what's the most amazing thing in this room is how many accomplished researchers and social and animal scientists who are working on these particular issues of politics is incredible. I mean, that's what's so impressive for everybody to talk to people about that. Uh, it really means that we've been making progress mm -hmm. over, over the last 35, 40 years, 40 years of that we've been working. So you should stay tuned about uh, updates, upgrades um, to the data sets, um, and we're going to try to, a lot of things will happen. The adolescent data set, I think, is going to be uh, in good shape. Uh, the multi-generational data set, or data sets, um, as you begin to think about that, family data set. Um, the issue with regard to mortality data, although um, there's some, some young brothers and sisters that are working on that, um, you know, probably before that, but we hope to be able to get that released. The geocoded data with regard to the NSAL and the uh, NSBA, we're working on that and trying to do what we can do. The final part of this is um, uh, the whole issue about um, another study, and I think everybody kind of, I got the idea that people feel the same way. It's time, in fact, it's over time. Um, so we're working on trying to do what we need to do. Um, and we'd like to involve many of you. Uh, you might get requests for testimonials. Um, for those of you, I think that's an important thing to think about. Uh, many of the people in this room, in fact, the, the, the vast majority of you are already accomplished researchers. Uh, you're getting your own kind of track record. Um, and what you have to say about what the needs are have meaning to them. You know, you're not just, you know, starting out, you're not just spreading information across the system. So get you all. But many of you now are accomplished researchers who have a voice. And your voice can help with regard to being able to really do whatever we're going to call it, whatever, the, the study of, of the black population uh, at, the, at the beginning of the 21st century. Uh, so we're going to try to do that, you know, and uh, take this one of the things that PRBA will commit itself to and, and again, with the same kind of model and providing opportunities for people with regard to the data. Uh, and making it available to the whole community. So we're in a serious time. Okay? I just wanted to say that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Anybody have a last word? Anything they want to add? Yes. Okay. <laughs> you see, we're good friends. But usually, it, when anything of this magnitude uh, really comes off, uh, a lot of times you can trace it uh, to one or two people who are really the, the moving forces 
behind this. You know, it's great to have a vision, uh, it's great to have some spirits, but sooner or later somebody has to roll up their sleeves, get to work, you know, make sure those of us who want to help know what we're supposed to do, which, rec which uh, direction we're supposed to go, and, and that is uh, leadership. So I would like everybody to stand up and give an ovation to the